Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It is a special pleasure to offer these welcoming remarks. Sustainability is perhaps the most pressing issue facing the global community today. And I'm proud to say it is an issue that the University of Toronto is taking a leading role in addressing. The ideas raised in this symposium remind us of the vital importance of harnessing technology in the service of people and planet. Just across the street from the symposium's venue, there's a wonderful example of this. Beneath King's College Circle, we've created Canada's largest urban geo-exchange system, 374 holes, 250 meters deep, now accommodate a closed loop system that will cool a cluster of 15 nearby buildings in the summer by extracting surplus heat and storing it underground. Then in winter, it will use that same energy to heat those buildings, avoiding an estimated 15,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually the equivalent of removing 3,000 cars from the road. Meanwhile, the roadway that used to comprise King's College Circle has been transformed into a pedestrian precinct with members of our community enjoying walkways, green space, trees, and gardens. This is an example of technology as a sustainable, harmonizing, and connecting force, the kind of humanistic intelligence explored and celebrated at this important symposium. I'd like to congratulate and thank the symposium's hosts, Professor Steve Mann of the University of Toronto and Dr. Yu Yuan, President of the IEEE Standards Association. And thank you for your kind attention. I wish you all a successful, productive, and inspiring symposium. So, uh, yeah, what we want to talk about here is sustainable technology society. And the, the kind of at the nexus of the physical world of atoms, sustainability, and the environment, earth, water, air, and uh, climate, and those sorts of things. And then technology, uh, virtual AI, virtual worlds, uh, the world of computation, and uh, what we sometimes call the environment, the boundary between the environment and the environment. And then, and finally, society, which is, is uh, humanity, uh, as well as other species beyond the human race, and society, governance, law, ethics, all of the human constructs, and all of the beings on the planet. And so uh, we, we're right at the nexus, and we call that the environment. So we, we, we talk about the, the, the environment, the environment and the environment, or you know, the physical, virtual, and social. And we have those three axes, the physical world of atoms, the technological world of bits and the social world of genes, atoms, bits, and genes. Genes is a Greek word. It starts with the letter gamma, the first letter, the third letter of the Greek alphabet. So we have the first three letters of the Greek alphabet for these axes, alpha, beta, and gamma. And we kind of want to come right to where they all meet. So where a virtual world meets physical and social. The metaverse is a shared virtual reality, so it's got the beta and gamma. So we could call it the physical metaverse, or you, Yuan, and I were calling it the sustainable metaverse. Others often talk about uh, various terms for it. We also have some concepts like HCI, human computer interaction, and we can call it the physical HCI or sustainable HCI. So um, I think, uh, um, now Tom, you've worked a lot in virtual worlds, and virtual world society, you're the founder of the virtual world society. Tell us, maybe talk a little bit about how you can see shared virtual worlds that connect to the earth, you know, uh, virtuality for um, people and planet, shall we say, or virtuality for earth and everything. Yeah, even with that one, I wouldn't expect that, but uh, thanks for the opportunity to, um, uh, to elaborate on this. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we as humans um, can all identify with is this idea that we are in an environment. I mean, there's, there, there's this embodiment of whatever we want to call it, our spirit that's with this dirt that surrounds us, right? 
And so, uh, but there's something that's certainly inside of us, but there's also something that we call outside of us. And that's, uh, that has to do with an environment. And that environment can be what occurs naturally, what we call the natural world, or it can be something that we actually create, construct from what's the atoms in the, in the natural world. And so, in, in the end, it's about place. Where are we? And uh, one of the things about virtual reality is it brings this place this into question. Because, for example, if you put a headset on, which becomes a transportation system for your senses, it can take you to another place. Now, uh, this place uh, can have different manifestations in your own mind based upon what we call immersivity. Are you immersed in this? I mean, does it sort of fill your visual, acoustic, tactile, all the senses? Or is it something that is sort of set into the physical world? And we've discovered over the past years in terms of just playing around with this idea of virtual worlds is that it makes a big difference because there seems to be, at least in the research I've done, a switch that takes place. When I was doing my original work uh, in the super cockpit uh, for the Air Force, we had uh, we had created this this uh, three-dimensional display, this 120-degree um, instantaneous field of view, which you could move around. And um, and what it did, what we found is that it was amazing when you put this on and turned it on because it was like you weren't looking at a picture anymore. It was like somebody reached out of the picture and pulled you inside and now you're in a place. And it changed everything in terms of the way that you thought about it. Because when you're in a place, you completely forget about the physical place you're in. And now you're transformed into a virtual place. So these virtual places, uh, basically we operate our senses in this alternative place, alternative universe. Even though we're sitting in a physical chair, maybe, and, uh, and a, but we don't notice that, and we don't even think about that. As a matter of fact, one of the big things that happens is when you take the headset off, you say, wait a minute, <laughs> I was just in this fish tank, going around with a fish, and now all of a sudden I'm back in this other place. This is right, because it seems like I have two worlds in, while I'm in, in one place. So what this all means, I believe, um, and back to your question, Steve, is that uh, this idea of the transportation system for our senses um, does take us into things that we have grown up experiencing in the real world, that we take those into the virtual world. Now the question is what we do in the virtual world, because we can do things in the virtual world we can't do in the physical world, like we can walk at the speed of light. We can make our inner pupillary distance 10 million light years. And uh, to see the universe in a, in a three dimensions rather than the two dimensions when we're looking at the sky. And so, how does this change us? And this is where we get to some, almost a reprogramming of the way that we think about things. And uh, that we, it's, it's an amazing expansion of the model we have, models that we have in the world, and, uh, and, and what we could do in the world especially when we are trying to connect with other people and we can be in places with other people that don't really exist physically. So all of these lines that you're drawing in the immersivity, you know, are indeed uh, real. I mean, uh, it's a way to, uh, it's a sort of a lexicon or a nomenclature that we can use to describe these different kinds of experiences. But one of the things I want to mention is one other thing we've sort of forgotten and that is, where is your spirit when you're inhabiting an avatar somewhere else? Is it sitting in physical space or is it sitting in a virtual space? And uh, we've, we've been doing some interesting experiments of, about that that show, wait a minute, you can experience things spiritually through your avatar. So in other words, 
Why, why is the avatar any different than your physical body? It's like putting on a raincoat. And moving you somewhere else. And so I, this, is, this begs all kinds of questions of now, you need to add a, another dimension, sort of a meta dimension on top of what you've already shown of the technology, physical, and society. Because, you know, this now means, okay, now there are other levels of communication that may have to do with things that we don't normally think about in terms of spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication. Now, I could take us off in, into another whole symposium about that. But uh, nevertheless, I just want to be provocative in my, uh, my answer to your question. <laughs> Excellent. That was really good. I would almost venture to say that spirituality is a, is a human construct. Um, and, and it sort of belongs part of the uh, society. It's a social, human sort of thing. It's very human, um, the human spirit. Uh, and, and so, but yeah, I think that's really good. And, and, uh, and the connections. Uh, uh, one thing I want to ask Avi uh, uh, to elaborate on is, is sort of how these connections are made. Like if you think of the three axes, you know, the, the, the physical, virtual, and social, each of them is interconnected to the other, uh, to the others in a bi-directional way. So, for example, uh, with the physical environment, we humans receive from our environment. We receive food, water, air, and, and in fact, clean water and fresh air are basic human rights. We give our waste products back to the environment, so sanitation is also an additional human right. It's a feedback loop to and from the environment, both physically and informatically, sense their environment, uh, we can see what's around us, and uh, we sense it and, and we also affect it. And so uh, when we take a VR headset, for example, it can block us off from nature, it can cut us off from nature, block us from seeing nature. It can also encumber us, even if it's an augmented reality set that allows us to still see nature. If we can't go for a hike in the woods or go for a swim with the technology, it, it makes us turn our back on it. Technology. I've seen so many people afraid to go out in the rain because they don't want to get their iPhone wet, or they they don't want to go for a hike in the forest, or they don't want to go for a swim because it's not waterproof, or they are afraid to leave it sitting on the beach or it's stolen. So in this way, the technology functions like handcuffs, uh, encumbering us and keeping us from nature. So there's this two-way street between the environment and the and, and, and the human, for example, and the technology can get in the way of that. And obviously, of course, the technology connects to and from us as a feedback loop. We type on the computer while looking at our screen. That's to and from. And technology itself goes to and from the environment. The technology senses its environment and affects its But uh, the connections that are less obvious are that how technology facilitates or he facilitates our connection to the environment. And, and Abby, with all your work with HoloLens and, and Apple Vision Pro, uh, maybe you could comment on that because when I look at these technologies, you know, one of my favorites is the music smart switch because it helps me get into nature. It doesn't keep me away from nature. It actually helps me facilitate my connection to nature. It brings me closer to earth, closer to sustainability, closer to the world around me, closer to other humans because we swim in groups. Go for a nice water swim with all my friends. I can watch my vital signs on the head-up display <clears throat> and it allows me to push safely, safely push hard uh, and get a strong, beautiful dose of this, this cold water and health benefit uh, and, and stay in touch with my own body and with my surroundings and see maps of where all the rocks are, where the hazards are, find my way and not get lost. And so as an example, the smart zone is an example of a technology that I would say is immersive. If it can immerse you, you should be able to immerse it, immersive and submersive. Like, like so many of these technologies immerse us. You know, they, they're, they're immersive, they, they surround us. But yet, we can't immerse them. You know, like, like what I almost don't like is a, something that goes over my head that blocks completely, it closes me, but then I can't completely close it. I can't go for a swim with it or go for a night with it or go for a walk with it or bump into the table and put on that. Uh, one of these <coughs> VR headsets and then walking around in my living room and I bash into the table and smash my leg against the table. Um, and, and 
so maybe you can speak to that. <laughs> okay. I'll give, you, I'll give you three examples of where this comes into play. You mentioned two of them. The third one, um, I'll throw in there, is Google Earth, which I got to work on really early on. And one of the big values, you could think of Google Earth as an augmented reality experience, although it's not something you wear in your head or walk around the world in. It's, it's meant to give you a sense of, of what it might be like if you were to look at the entire Earth uh, from above which astronauts have told us is incredibly transformative. When you can see the entire planet in, within your view, you start to get how connected and how small everything really is and how, how we are all a part of that, of that ecosystem. And that was one of the hopes for Google Earth was that, that back then it was called Keyhole, but one of the hopes is that it would give people an understanding of the world that they live in so they don't only see the 10 or 20 feet around them that they see every day, but really see the whole thing. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of the definition of a holistic view in a way that that perspective is incredibly important and the ability to fly from place to place and, and enjoy that, that travel from, from a virtual copy of place to place. And when you experience that same thing in VR, as, as Google put out Google Earth VR, it becomes even more uh, immersive, as we'd say, that, that you start to feel that it's even more real because now you really feel like you're flying around. So, that's example one, of, I think, where technology can, can, even though it's putting us out in space, it grounds us in a psychological sense. It makes us understand the world better. Number two would be the HoloLens, and we, we argued a lot about what, how we were going to do this because at the time that we started the project in, in, in 2010, um, you know, the Kinect had promised to get rid of the controller. Now, you are the controller, so it was very controversial that we were going to put something on your body in order to give you a whole new experience. We wanted to get rid of technology so you don't see it. Um, and, but ultimately, it was the only way to do it, was to be able to provide uh, an, optically, uh, an optical see-through kind of a device. Because the goal is you should be able to see the other people in the room with you, not walk into them or walk into the table. The real world should always be present for you, even though you might be playing a game. And actually, that project started as a gaming system before it went into more serious uses. Um, and so that was a very strong tenet of that project, was you should, you should always be able to see the eyes of the other people in the room and know where they are and have a full sense of proprioception of your own body, know where your limbs are, know what you're about to hit. And it was very important. Um, and, and what I can say about the Apple Vision Pro is that it's also important, except that it, it takes a different approach to solving that problem. So it uses a video pass-through system, which you could argue removes you from the world now because you have this layer of cameras and displays between you and the world. But if you do it perfectly, if you do it so that the latency is imperceptible and the, and the position of the cameras becomes virtually inside your eyeballs, which is where it should be, right? you don't want the, the physical cameras, even though they have to be out front, you need to be able to reproject the imagery so that it, it is like it was taken from your own eyes. When you do that correctly, it's almost like you're not wearing a headset at all. You forget even more so than with some transparent AR glasses that I've used, because the field of view is so large and because you don't notice that it's video, you really do get the sense of the world has now become magic. The world now can contain things that were physically impossible before um, and they seem real. And, the, and the, the shading is correct, the coloring is correct, which is hard to do in the, in the other technology of, 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 tra of optical transparency. It's very hard to create shadows. So anyway, this solves a lot of those problems. And when people get to try it next year, I'm really hoping that everybody has this experience of, even though I'm putting on a helmet in some ways and goggles, it, I feel now more connected to the world around me. Because an example of what, what Apple Vision Pro does is you may be very immersed in some, some 3D spreadsheet you're working on. You have, you're really focused on your work in front of you. But when your child approaches you and they want to talk to you, they're going to break through. Unlike in, in VR, you're going to see their face and they're going to see your eyes looking at them when you're paying attention to them. So there's a social interaction that's going to happen with people wearing a headset and people not wearing a headset that is going to not break the social bonds that we have. It's meant to bring them together. Uh, and I think that will get proven out next year when everybody gets to try it. You'll get to see for yourself how, how important that is. It might seem silly, it might seem superfluous and an extra expense, but it's incredibly important to maintain social cohesiveness because what we're trying to do at the end of the day is bring people together, right? We're not trying to isolate them. In fact, ha had the decision makers on the project felt that, that this device was going to be socially isolating, it would have never gotten off the ground. It was only because we were able to prove 
that we could actually bring people together with or without the device in the same room, any mix of devices. Um, yeah. So those are three examples of where we know how important this stuff is and we're trying to preserve what's important and enhance the, the, the qualities that we already have. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think you really addressed, like if we look at the diagram, the six uh, connections of immersivity, uh, and they're, they're, they're all numbered in a standard way so that any of the diagrams will use the same numbering. Uh, one and two, one represents your ability to sense your environment, and two represents your ability to, to interact with your environment. And, and so I think on, on connection one, I, I've no doubt that the Apple Vision Pro um, is, is good. Like, like even though you can't directly see the environment, it has a fairly, I, I, I have no doubt that the camera resolution is sufficient and also that it hopefully meets the ISHAP criteria. In my book, I identified the criteria of collinearity and you know, all these things. So a ray of light coming into the eye is collinear with a ray of light that's resynthesized on the other side so that it doesn't give you a dizziness, flashbacks, disorientation, um, and right. brain damage, as some people were saying, or maybe just learning a different model that's hard to unlearn. But um, the other uh, thing that is not so evident, or maybe not addressed immediately, is is your ability to in, in, engage with the environment around you as well. Like, two things about the original ITAP. One is it, it allows you to sense and understand the world around you. And two, it allows you to engage. You can climb a ladder while wearing it climb a rope while wearing it, you can hike in the woods, you can go for a swim while wearing it. And so uh, all of these sorts of things that it allows you to that allow you to engage with nature, that would sort of be more my concern that maybe it's such an expensive piece of kit that you'd be afraid to uh, go for a walk in the forest or a swim or hang out at the beach with it get full of sand or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not really meant for those things. I think that um, it, it's, it's, I think it, it, people probably can try it outdoors, but I, I, I wouldn't, honestly, I wouldn't wear any headset yet while driving, for example. Like, that would be, I would not yet trust any device uh, on the market to be able to be correct, because you also need your full peripheral vision, right? There's all sorts of things that come into play when you start going outdoors and doing things that could be dangerous. So safety is the most important thing. This, this, this at the very least will make it so that you can be safe in your in your own environment uh, and not trip over things uh, and be as comfortable as you can. But it's what about, the, 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 what about uh, its use as a seeing aid? So, for example, uh, if it's a well-designed apparatus, it could help people see. And in this sense, yeah. uh, somebody who, who who would be able to use this to like eyeglasses, you know, like the, the eyeglasses that you're wearing help you see. Sure. So you'd want to wear those while driving or riding a bicycle or or, or uh, I mean, if you had the prescription, the right prescription for swim glass while swimming, and, and to be able to see and understand your environment. So ideally the technology will not only uh, satisfy conditions one and two of the versivity uh, manifesto, but it would also uh, actually enhance them and improve them so that your connection to the environment is improved. Like the eyeglasses you're wearing now probably help you connect to your environment. If you're going for a hike in the woods, you'll be able to see different species of birds better than you would if you didn't have them on. So, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm farsighted, so these are helping with my near vision, so I will take them off when I hike. But, um, but yes, I get your point, a lot of people are, are, um, are nearsighted and they, and they would need glasses to go to see far. Um, I, I'm not going to say that, that I think the Apple Vision Pro will be great for many, many things. I don't think it's yet the headset we would take when we go hiking. I think there will be other designs, from maybe from them, maybe from other companies that will be more meant for the, what, what we ultimately need is kind of like what you've, you've pioneered is that all day wearable that isn't something that you only get a couple hours of battery life on, but it's something you can wear anywhere. Um, and the challenges are making that socially acceptable and making it lightweight enough and the heat issues, you know all the issues. Yeah. So, so we're, not, we're not at the end of that road yet. We're, at, we're still at the beginning, uh, early phases of that, of that road. And it's going to still take a few years before we have the ultimate glasses that I think will do everything people want. Right now you have to make choices, you have to make trade-offs and, and decide what it's for and make it really good for what it's for, but you can't make it good for everything. But a lot of companies have made that mistake of trying to make one device that works for all cases and it's just not yet possible. Um, so you make those choices. And, and, um, but I think one of the other points you made, if, if, you, if you don't mind riffing on this for a second is, and this ties back to Tom's point too, is 
the interaction with the environment is, is critical. This is something we learn as babies when we're sitting in our in our crib and we reach up and we hit the mobile that's that's sitting above us. We learn. This is where consciousness begins. We learn if we do something, there's a reaction. The world has a response. If we cry, you know, mom or daddy comes. And so it's our, our call out to the environment, our manipulation of the environment, and then the response of the environment is what makes things real. And in fact, what makes us real. Because if, if you were to go into a virtual world and nothing you do has any effect on the world, you will start questioning your own reality at a certain point where you feel like a ghost that has no impact. So it's incredibly important that all these various environments we move through have, uh, it doesn't have to be the same sense of interaction, but a, a true sense of interaction if it's appropriate for all of them. Yeah, well, yeah that's, that's no, well, go ahead, John. Is, is, uh oh, the bandwidth issue here. Did he cut up? It, it happened to me too, he'll rejoin in a sec. Um, that when Tom started talking the first time, I got dropped and, and rejoined. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that, that, a lot of those ideas make make sense. He's back. Tom, you're back. I'm back. Yeah, I hope I can remember what I was going to say, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things that back to back would obvious say, you know, the uh, we're using these tools, uh, these technology tools, uh, to go in both directions. Certainly, the directions in terms of the physical side of things, the environmental side of things, uh, the atoms and and, this, and the genes, as you as you put it here, Mercedes. But um, there are other, some things there that, that are sort of interesting we need to think about, and that is we have to make sure we're doing the mapping properly. Now, in the ITAP book, you, you talk about this a little bit, but there are things that we uh, perceive but that we're not aware of perceiving. Perception without awareness. For yeah. one example of that is the far peripheral retina. I mean, we are only aware to about maybe about 200 degrees of a total field of view uh, based upon the experiment, experimental evidence. But there's a whole another uh, uh, 20 degrees behind that that we don't perceive or don't appear to perceive or we aren't aware of perceiving. But there's something going on there. And that maps, who knows where that maps into? I mean, there's evidence it maps into the subconscious and into the limbic system and things like that. So to be complete as we're going into these um, environments that are generated, we have to take these things into account. So that is, that is a, and if we're going to generate um, a mercivity, sustainability environment, uh, there needs to be harmony across these three things. We need to, we need to tune the part that we can manipulate, um, which actually we can play both of those uh, <laughs> eventually. But um, we have to understand that. So uh, our models that we build and, and growing up, our ability to comprehend the physics of our environment, as is, I'll be mentioned, I mentioned earlier, that you know we can change the physics in virtual environments. And so what does that mean in terms of the way we interact with this one? That could be used for good, or it could be used for, for bad in a way. It could, it could harm our way. For example, in the early days of VR, I found myself running into door jams. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because normally you don't worry about that. You know, you just sort of walk through the room into another. But, uh, and then also, uh, when we had the, um, the days of um, longer latencies, uh, when I was driving my car and I turned my head, I'm, and I'm, you know, if I'm wearing a headset, there's a, a delay, there's a latency. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, but you, you can, can adapt to that. You can adapt to that. Yeah. Uh, and that's the plasticity of the human uh, uh, capability. We, we are able to adapt to that, but then now we have two coefficients stored in our head. And, uh, and so you, I would get uh, vertigo just by moving my head when I was driving the car, having spent a lot of time. Yeah, you get, some people will call that brain damage. I guess it's learning and mapping that, that yeah. is anticipatory. And then so when you take the eyeglasses off, you, you have the, 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 the inverse map, like, like the, right. uh, but, it can but, have long persistent well, flashbacks. Yeah, I, we're solving those problems and, and we're getting better and better. And, and uh, but the, the end game, I believe, is okay. 
how do we make everything work in harmony? And a lot of that has to do with our comprehension. Our comprehension comes from the experiences that we have. And, uh, and so the experiences that we have are important, it was important for us to uh, direct those, I believe, so that we understand these interconnectivities within the three in environments that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we need harmony between the physical, uh, virtual, and social. You know, like an overall harmony. If we think of it like a Venn diagram, the like interconnections talk about the intersections you need to pair. And then there needs to be a central element between all three. Uh, if, if we think of, say, the three spheres, or three shapes, the drop, the, the, the blue drop, which is sustainability, the, the green rectangle, which is technology, and the red circle, which is humanity. If we think like a Venn diagram, there'll be a point right in the center. I think what you're hitting on is the harmony that we need at the nexus of all three, which is, is sort of maybe an additional seventh uh, um, addition, let's say. Well, there's also the genes. I, back to the uh the, the social side, the, hu the human genes, that kind of thing. You know, it's not like it's constant. You know, there's the whole area of epigenetics. And uh, that, uh, you know, part of our, our genetic structure is not programmed, uh, you know, uh, 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 to begin with. And that uh, there's, uh, there are, are environmental things, social things, all of it that, that do add to that. So we take that that epigenetic structure with our, our, our gene profile. Um, uh, and it's probably changing all along. But then when with our offspring, you know, some of that's transmitted offspring. And so we can see this in nature and other animals and things like that, that, that some of the uh, genetic uh, uh, configurations are transferred to the children that they've learned, that the parents have learned having been a bird or something like that. Especially true with pros kind of thing. And, uh, and so, so in a way, we're, we're not only uh, the environment programming ourselves, we're programming future generations. And uh, so there is a big arrow going to the, the human side, the genetic side. It's not just uh, something that, that we have inherently, it's something that also can be changed by all of these other environmental considerations. That's, uh, I think that's why I, I, I like the notion of society. Like the IEEE tagline uh, is advancing technology for humanity, but I wanted to change it to advancing technology for society because it includes the things like offspring, uh, does the technology do reproductive damage, you know, all those kinds of other questions. And then also uh, uh, for Earth, or, or, or people, so advancing technology for people and planet, or more generally advancing technology for Earth and everyone, where everyone is a little bit broader than just people to also include other species. Yeah, other species. Well, you know, one of the things that's on top of this is that while, <clears throat> while we may have had some uh, evolutionary changes in the last, let's say, hundred thousands of years, we're, we're still basically the same as we were when our only tools were stone uh, and wood uh, and, and maybe fire. Like, you could take a being from 100,000 years ago as a child, pop them into today's society, and they'll grow up just like the rest of us. Um, and, and so we're still genetically programmed for that world. Like, we haven't fully adapted yet to any of these new things. And so we have to always think about that. Our social interactions are still 100,000 years old. We, we, we are effectively designed for small groups. We're not designed for these giant societies that we have built for ourselves. And that, you know, that, that incompatibility means we have a lot to learn, right? In, in, in the learned part of our existence, we have, you know, it used to be, you know, just till puberty, and now we, we, we still have learning to do through 18 to 21, and we're not quite even done, you know? Like I would say, you know, I'm still, I'm still learning things in my 50s that I wish I'd learned a long time ago. And, and so, so there's, there's these things, these ways of relating to the world and to other people that do seem to take a really long time for us to augment our programming from the initial instructions that we're born with, right? Um, and, and one of the things we might be able to do is maybe try to speed that up a little bit so that everybody born 
can be can get to the wisdom part of their existence a lot sooner, uh, rather than having to go make every mistake over and over again, which is what we seem to be fated to do. We seem to have to go make all the same mistakes that everybody else has made so that we get the same wisdom. But there's got to be a better way to convey that, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one other thing, too, maybe that you can touch on is is technologies like the Microsoft HoloLens and the, and the Apple Vision Pro, you know, they, they, they do appear to be trying to meet uh, conditions one and two of the, of the manifesto, and in fact, three and four, because they have input devices and output devices, where they might have fallen short or might have not realized, because I think when people, when I explain recivity to people, they go, ah, aha, it makes sense. And, and it's five and six that elude people the most because that's the connection between technology and the environment around us. And most of the technologies yeah. has sensors that sense the environment, but very little to give back to it. Now, when, when I say environment, I mean uh, the opposite of environment. Like, I'm the environment. My clothing is the environment between the environment and the environment. What's around me is the environment. So you're part of my environment, and I'm part of your environment. And so environmentalism means do no harm to Earth and others, and uh, what that and, uh, of all species. And what that means is is really with five and six, uh, five the technology definitely senses the environment. But to what extent is the Apple Vision Pro or the Hololens? Well, it's certainly not the Hololens, but I hope the Apple Vision Pro is communicative to others. Property number six. That is to say. It has this social indicia upon it. You know, I built these glasses years ago yeah. with outwards facing display that shows my own, like you either see my eyes through the display, it gives you a rendition of my eye, my eyes so you can see my facial expression, or it gives you even information like what I'm doing so you can see the activity and I'm engaged and you can see my virtual world. When you look in my eyes, you see my eyes and also the virtual world I'm in. So you've got social yeah. engagement and context this property six. And maybe you could speak yeah. to that. I, I think that's a lot of what's what's driving that outward facing display. It's exactly what you said. I think that the need to reflect back to other people our state is, is part of the normal social engagement. We have, you know, in psychology they use terms like joint attention. Yeah. Which means yes, yes, yes. When, if you and I are in the same room, I can tell that you're looking at the same thing I'm looking at. Yes, sure. And I don't have to look at you, I can look at the thing and we can say that. We can use the word that. And you know what I mean, I know what you mean. Yeah. And so I think the hardware can't get in the way of this. And we have to the hardware has to facilitate the communication between people. And we're seeing that with AI as well now, uh, as well too, where pe the people coming from the AI side of things, um, are, are now talking about multimodal AI, which is where we've always been in, in XR, which is like, yeah, of course, of course we have to be sensing the world so that the computer can understand your environment so that we can help you avoid the table, but also help you with what your work is, help with, help with what you're trying to do, or facilitate the social uh, interactions that you're having with people around you. But that's a very local form of, of, of connecting people in their local environment, which is super important, but there's also a a much more global sense of this too, and I think both the HoloLens and the Apple Vision Pro are described much more as as AR devices than VR devices, and it, because they're not designed to take you out of the world, right? A, a pure VR device, uh, not necessarily in one of the ways Tom's used them in his career, are meant to enhance the world as well. So VR may be a little a, a misnomer on that, is it? Because anytime we're using technology to enhance our interaction with the world, I say that falls on the the AR end of the spectrum, where we're trying to not change your place. We're, we're trying to take the place you're already in and enhance it, enhance your, your, your ability to, to experience it. So on the grand scale, what does that mean? It means, it means being able to connect more with, with the natural world, even though you're adding technology. We want, we want you to feel connected to your local environment. We also want you to feel more connected to the world. And this is a, this is a problem we have all, all across the of a, or, um, the business cycle, let's say, whatever whatever economics you know, any particular country's in, we have this concept of externalities. There's things that matter, and apparently there there are some things that don't matter. Like, you know, for a lot of people, all of the trash that we generate is an externality. We don't think about it. It goes to the, it goes to the waste dump. Yeah, the yeah. more that we exclude externalities and say everything matters, every interaction we have counts. The more we're going to actually care 
about the whole world because it's all connected. We, we can't just live in a bubble of, of only the people around us. And, and so I think these technologies are designed to keep us grounded more in the, in the, the natural world. I won't say the real world because it's all real to us, but they're, they're designed to keep us grounded more in the natural world than some past attempts, let's say, you know, with Oculus, for example. It was all about games. It was all about escapism. And, and that's nothing wrong with entertainment and going places for a few hours. But we spend 90% of our waking time in the real world uh, not doing escapism. So let's make that part better. Let's, let's enhance our ability to interact with the world and each other. And, and the simplest possible thing you can think of would be just, you know, you're walking down the street with some future AR type glasses and you see there's a pothole and you, you note it. You've, co you've collected enough information about the world that somebody can come, hopefully as soon as possible, and actually fill the pothole. You're actually changing the world, the local environment, yeah, you're actually based on that. You're actually right? improving the world around you. So, so it, it does, it sounds like Apple has become, shall we say, aware of Mercivity, because I was really disappointed with the HoloLens. But I think I might find that the, the, the Apple Vision Pro hits the sweet spot in the sense that it, it becomes immersive, like, like for all the, for for all the mercies, you know, it becomes immersive and exmersive uh, and submersive, so that the technology doesn't just immerse you, but it also improves the world. It helps fix potholes. It helps build a society. It builds a sustainable technology society. When you talk about VR and AR, um, uh, we're really we're limiting ourselves. This big argument about VR and AR that people spend so much effort on. Uh, there's AR, VR, and back in 1991, Charles Wyckoff and I came coined the term XR, extended reality. And what we said is, is, is take, uh, you know, if you're in the alpha beta plane, which is where the realities are, like, like VR is in the beta plane. It's it's just the, the virtual only, and AR is kind of this, the partly in the beta and alpha. It's, VR is right on the beta axis, whereas AR is on the alpha beta plane, and what we said is give us XR that interpolates between all the realities as well as extrapolates beyond them. And, and so XR is still that plane though. And if we come out of the page along the gamma axis, we're starting to pick up this really interesting behavior. And, and, and that's where immersivity and exmersivity, uh, or more generally immersivity, all the verses, um, come together. I think in, in particular, uh, I'm very hopeful that the Apple Vision Pro will hit on properties five and six you hit the nail right on the head with the pothole example, because that's an example of doing good for society and making the world a better place. And I noticed that Apple just recently announced they're no longer doing leather, and I thought that's really good. They're actually embracing the idea of doing no harm to other beings, such as, 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 as cattle. And, and so you can feel the energy. I think that Apple's starting to grow an ethos, and it may well be that they would be the first company that embraces immersivity head on. I, 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 that was my experience there was that, the, the, you know, I don't speak for the company, but the feeling I got in the, in the years I spent there was, we've been very successful, we've made a lot of money, so, so we, we owe it, we, we owe more than just delivering products. We have to really think about the, 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 the whole ecosystem. And they're, they've gotten really good about recycling everything, and they're gonna be carbon oh, neutral. They're, 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 they don't claim perfection, but, but they're, they seem to be really working hard, but that, but but for some companies that's a bit of a luxury, unfortunately. That that's that's given the business model they have, they can do that because their their job is to provide the best products to people, maybe more expensive instead of some companies, um, but they're not subsidized by things like advertising, which can drive us in the opposite direction. Right? We have well, if we, if we were to take money from companies that want to pretend there's nothing going on with the environment, that, that, that oil is fine, uh, keep, keep burning gas. There, there's, there are forces that are paying money for that point of view, and, and you, to be able to do good, to be able to really close the loop on this stuff, you have to kind of be free of those forces. You can't be, you can't be um, subject to their influence because you will wind up um, suppressing a lot of speech and, and keeping the wool pulled over people's eyes about the state of the world, and, and so I think Apple, in some cases, has a luxury because their job is just to sell really good products. Um, yeah, advertising right. is almost almost zero of their income. Well, advertising is is really touching on on, on property one of immersivity, because if my eyeglasses show me ads while I'm trying to uh, drive down the street, it's putting my life in danger. So pop-ups and all that sort of stuff. So in some ways, 
uh, the right to see is a fundamental right. If you're wearing a seeing aid and you don't want it to have a, an ad subscription model that inserts advertising in your vision while you're trying to drive or ride a bicycle or, or run uh, jogging or swimming or whatever, I don't want to smash into a rock because an ad came up in front of the while I was swimming uh, at the beach. And and so the the I think it's not just an ecosystem, but maybe it's also an ecosystem. Uh, yeah. Because I feel that Apple may be leading the charge in terms of turning us away from oil, away from exploitation of animals, uh, you know, all of the, the negatives, that the, the idea that maybe Apple will be kind to Earth and everyone, and maybe there's hope that companies aren't just going to exploit the Earth, exploit other people, exploit animals uh, for, for gain and profit. I think you, you see that the most on, on phones today with stuff like screen time. Like, and I think, again, don't speak for them, but I think they realized that people were spending way too much time on their phones, and so they gave us tools to spend less. But if it were a different kind of company, the financial incentive would be to spend more time, right? They would be driving us towards addiction instead of away from addiction. Yeah. So they have that luxury of trying to help us because it's, it's very consumer focused, it's in our interest. And I think that ultimately is the test for any one of these technologies is um, who benefits from its use? Who, who benefits the most anyway? Is it some unseen funder who's, who's making money off of us behind, our, behind our, our backs? Or is it the consumer? Is the person wearing the device the beneficiary of that technology? That, that's an important decision that all of us need to make in whatever we buy or choose to wear. We might get it cheaper, but we're not necessarily getting it better by going in a, in a way that's subsidized, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And maybe uh, it'll be fun to connect with the with the team. Maybe we can all get together and, 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 and connect with the team at Apple Vision and see if we uh, can weigh in collectively on how to how to embrace passivity head on. Like it will be nice after we've been doing this passivity previously known as humanistic intelligence or wearable AI or human AI or whatever you want to call it, social, social, social sustainable AI uh, uh, for the last, I guess since 1998, and then Marvin Minsky and Ray Kurzweil and I, you know, uh, I did that uh, 2013 paper on, um, on this topic. And I think it might be, after 25 years, it would be wonderful if, if a company finally embraced this, these six uh, tenets of this uh, manifesto. Well, one of the things I would um, like to add uh, as we're reaching the, our time limit here uh, is that what a, a great uh, uh, way for us to uh, press forward. I think having um, a, a taxonomy, a lexicon that, uh, that stimulates our thinking about these connections uh, really does help us uh, think about not only uh, uh, the technology needs, um, the, but also the, in, the how we are connected to all of these things and the importance of, of uh, understanding how they all work together to create this harmony. And I think this is a great contribution, Steve, that you're making in helping us come up with these new terms that uh, embody uh, ways that we haven't thought about it before. And the versivity uh, triad that you have uh, put together, I think, is a great step in that direction. Uh, as well as some of the other things that, uh, that have been done. So thanks for that opportunity to, to work with you and to have that kind of input to help us. You know, there are, there are a, a thousand PhD dissertations sitting there, you know, looking at these trajectories across the different uh, uh, connections in your uh, triad. Yeah, yeah, I like, uh, I like how you call it a triad. That's maybe a good name for it. It's like a tripod, you know, the three legs, the physical, virtual, and social, and each leg has two uh, branches to it, I suppose. Six legs, six legs and three pairs, or something like that, will be a triad if we think of those six elements of the manifesto, and the, uh, again, uh, in, in the context of the, of the, of the physical, uh, virtual, and social. It, it does make sense to think of it that way as a triad, and I think that, that maybe that's a good, a good analogy or metaphor as we write I think what we, when we write, as we write the proceedings, I want to pull us all together and write something that uh, that people can sign on to, maybe some kind of a manifesto that people can say, "Hey, I embrace passivity, or we embrace it in our 
beside ethos. That would be cool. I don't know, Abby, if you have anything to say about that, maybe with regards to Apple or any, anything in general. Um, I don't have any influence over what Apple calls things, uh, <laughs> but what I, what I can say, what I can say is, uh, you know, when I, while I was there, I pushed hard to use the more scientific, academic term for things like co-presence. I was, we all, we all use the word co-presence rather than branding it as something you could imagine what the brand might be, you know, given their other products. Um, no, we're going to use the scientific term, and I think, I, I don't know, but I think the motivation behind calling this a spatial computer. Um, is is also the same. It's like let's not overly brand things. Let's try to use really descriptive terms. Spatial computer is actually one of the easier terms for people to understand. Oh, it's a computer that works in the space around me. It it, 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 it uses my my local environment, and that's that makes sense. That's a spatial computer. Okay, I get it. Um, they have to. Their challenge is the marketing of how to get this across to make everybody understand what it is and what it isn't. So I think they've done a really good job at picking those terms so far. I think that. They, they probably would be cautious about uh, wordplay and picking up words that, where there's three words that sound similar, uh, like immersive, immersive. Like, I think that, that the, from the marketing angle, they might just say that's a little challenging to, to explain to people. But when you understand it, it all makes sense. So yeah. like with the many of the things you've done, Steve, I think sometimes these things take time. It's like you've put out terms and then 25 years later, everybody starts using them. Um, you just have to be consistent and keep doing it, and eventually you'll they'll use it, and eventually you'll get credit. But but it may take a while to 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 get those things out there. That's that's yeah, my I, sense of it because it, the simplicity stage, is also really important. At this stage in my life, I'm not even really looking for credit for anything because I've, I've kind of established myself. But I, I it is uh, heartwarming to see so many people using XR now that Charles Wyckoff and I came up with in 1991. Um, and yeah. so these things eventually, after 30 years or so, they start to permeate. 32 years, I guess, and the exactly. the, the thing about uh, uh, the spatial computing is it touches on the physical and on the virtual, but uh, where, where we need to really keep drive home the point is is the social and and uh, you know connecting the people. So we could say social spatial computing or um, uh, the other thing is spatial computing is a lot of syllables to say. So I don't know. We almost need something that's inclusive of of the three. Like like metaverse is another one. We gotta we gotta say physical metaverse, or we gotta say social spatial computing to capture uh, what uh, Tom would would identify as as the um, what did you say the tri uh, triad triad yeah the triad the tri um, I'm going to have to run. I'm, I'm leading a meeting at, at 10 here, so I'm going to have to start that up. Okay, well, that was second. fun. And I'm going to enjoy yeah. writing this up, and uh, we'll circle back very soon with a rough draft of the proceedings. Great. Okay, excellent. Yeah. That's been, that's been a great hour. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, it's a real fun. honor having you uh, connecting to you because I've followed your work for so many years, always admired your work, and it's really an honor to just share some time and space with you. Well, thanks. Right, take care, everybody.